Hello, this is Dr. J here with something a bit different from the usual Let's Plays I do on my channel. In recent months, I just became aware of the existence of an interesting project called the Commander X-16. If you're not familiar, the Commander X-16 is basically a computer designed by David Murray, aka the 8-bit guy, made with authentically 1980s hardware, but manufactured in the modern day. The point of this project is to give retro enthusiasts a platform to play and explore on without the difficulty of tracking down actual 30 to 40 year old hardware, not to mention the unreliability of same. Being a major retro enthusiast myself, this project is of great interest to me. I'm an indie game developer, and my indie game projects are generally pretty retro in their styling. But, even though they're retro style, I've always programmed my games on and for modern hardware. Programming a retro game on actual retro hardware has always been something that's interesting to me for a variety of reasons. The authenticity, the technical challenge, and the fact that people seem more appreciative of and receptive to retro games when they're actually made with the old hardware in mind. But, coming from a background of high-level modern programming, I was always a little intimidated by the extreme technical limitations and super low-level nature of programming on retro hardware. However, the Commander X-16 has made this retro game programming feel more achievable and accessible to me, so I've been using it as a gateway into the world of programming on very old hardware. This series of videos is going to serve as a devlog of my experiences with programming for the Commander X-16. It's going to serve as sort of a combination of documentary, a tutorial for other people interested in retro programming in general, or the X-16 in particular, and also to showcase my game projects once they're far enough along to be worth sharing. If any of that sounds interesting to you, then stick around as we embark on a deep dive into the fascinating and fulfilling world of retro game development. First, let's touch on some of the prerequisite knowledge that would be useful for retro programming in general, and the Commander X-16 in particular. Now, this is what you would need to know to do actual development on the X-16. You won't necessarily need to know everything that I'm about to list off if you're just interested in following along with these videos at a high level. Although, the more you know, the deeper your understanding will be. First, you'll want to have some basic knowledge of hardware. So you'll want to know a little bit about CPUs, including uh, registers and how they work, and you'll want to have an idea of what people mean when they use terminology like machine code, assembly, low and high level languages, and you'll want to know a little bit about RAM, uh, computer memory, and how it's accessed and addressed uh, in computer hardware. And honestly, just knowing that much is pretty much enough to get you going. You don't really need a super deep knowledge of CPU architectures or ISAs or any of that. Uh, if you're not familiar with any of that, giving explanations about those more basic concepts is kind of beyond the scope of what I'm going to do with these videos. But if you just do some internet searches on, you know, CPUs, CPU registers, how RAM is accessed, or just ask ChatGPT, or if you're watching this video in the future, whatever the future equivalent of ChatGPT is, you should be able to get a lot of information at your fingertips very easily. So beyond having some basic knowledge of computer hardware, you're also going to want to know a bit of computer programming. Ideally, you should be reasonably fluent in at least one programming language. For the purposes of my own development, I'm going to be using C. So if you know how to program in C, then you're pretty much good to go. A little bit of knowledge of assembly could also be useful, although that's going to be fairly tangential. We're going to be basically outsourcing the vast majority of the assembly to some external libraries. Uh, so not really the end of the world if you're not familiar with any of that. Uh, if you don't know any programming at all, then you can try to just uh, go in and learn C. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't dissuade you from doing it. But C can be a little bit of a handful for somebody who's never programmed before at all. Personally, when I first learned programming some decades ago, I cut my teeth on BASIC. And BASIC could be a good learning language for the Commander X-16, because the Commander X-16 takes a lot of its cues from the Commodore 64, 
which was essentially a basic machine. So as long as you can find a uh, working basic compiler or interpreter and some tutorials for it, then not a bad choice at all to learn some programming if you want to get into retro game development on the X16. A more popular choice for beginners to learn these days is Python. And that's not a bad choice because it does teach you, you know, all the fundamentals and basics of programming. And it's very easy to find a lot of material on and tutorials on Python these days because of its popularity. So that can also be a good option. But as I said, the language that we're actually going to be using ourselves for this development is C. So ultimately, if you want to be able to do this development too, or understand a lot of details about what we're doing, then knowing C programming is going to be pretty crucial for that. Uh, likewise, explaining much about C is going to be beyond the scope of these videos, but there are many tutorials and these days also AI chatbots who can help you with that journey if you're interested in learning that programming language, if you don't already. Next, let's discuss some basics of how the Commander X16 is architected. We're just going to start with a very high level explanation first, and we'll dive down into the lower level details as they become relevant to our development journey. First, the CPU. The CPU is a variant of the 6502. This is a processor that was common in home computers in the 80s, and a version of it was also used as the CPU in the original Nintendo Entertainment System. It's old, primitive, and its capabilities are very limited by modern standards. But the version of it in the X16 is clocked at 8 MHz, which is much faster than the 6502 variants used in the 80s, so we've got that much going for us. If we were going to program our game in assembly, which is absolutely an option, but we're going a little higher level, then we would need to know a lot more about the 6502's architecture. But since we're using C, we can get away with being fairly ignorant of the 6502's architectural details, and at least at the time of this recording, I don't know much about how it works internally, though I will pick up more knowledge of it as it becomes necessary and as time allows. Second, the memory. The X16's memory is basically divided into three categories. You have the immediately accessible low RAM, which is 64 kilobytes. However, some amount of this is actually taken up by the system kernel and some other things, so our program actually only has access to about 40k of RAM, plus an additional 8 kilobyte bank into high RAM. This is extremely limiting. One of the reasons for this limitation is that the X16 and other hardware of the era only had 16 bits for addressing memory and 64 kilobytes, which is to say 65,536 bytes, is the highest number that can be represented with 16 bits. Next is the VRAM, or video RAM. We have twice as much of this, 128 kilobytes. We can manage this because, when addressing into VRAM, we use one extra bit from an, addi an additional register, which doubles the amount of memory we can access. This VRAM has to hold all of the graphical data that we're displaying on screen, plus some metadata about how those graphics are displayed, like which tiles we're showing and where the different sprites are on screen. Again, this is very limiting, although if you're creative, you can squeeze some surprisingly impressive visuals out of 128K. Finally, there's the high RAM. This provides us with an additional 512 kilobytes, Technically, it's expandable up to 2 megabytes, but for the purposes of my development, I'm going to try to cram all of my games into the 512k default. Now, as we discussed, we don't have sufficient bit width to address that much RAM. So the way it works is, you pull one 8 kilobyte bank of memory at a time out of high RAM and into the 8 kilobyte bank in low RAM, which is reserved for precisely this purpose. This extra 512k of RAM is really crucial for having enough space to create more interesting and robust games, because you can use it to hold a bunch of extra graphics and sound data and other kinds of special game data that are specific to your game that wouldn't be able to fit in low RAM and VRAM. It's a little complicated to use because you can only access it 8 kilobytes at a time, but the idea is you can keep a bunch of extra data in high RAM until you need it and then copy it into VRAM or into your 8 kilobyte bank in low RAM as necessary. Finally, 
there's the VERA, which stands for Video and Enhanced Retro Adapter. This is the X16's graphics and video control chip. It serves as the main interface between the system's CPU and the display, providing advanced graphics capabilities for retro-style computing. The VERA is responsible for rendering graphics on the screen and is responsible for rendering sprites and tiles. It supports a color palette of up to 256 colors, which is quite rich and vibrant for a 1980s style machine. The VERA's behavior is configured and controlled through a set of memory mapped registers. Essentially, the way you can think of it is, we control every aspect of how our game's graphics are rendered by flipping a bunch of switches, which is to say t turning certain bits on and off, which instructs the VERA about things like our screen resolution, color depth, display mode, and everything else about the graphics. Let's conclude this introduction by discussing some resources and tutorials which I've found useful for teaching myself about programming on the Commander X16. I'll include links to all of this in the description, but do note that it's kind of hard to future-proof things like this, so if you're watching this video long after it was posted, I can't guarantee that all of these links will work far into the future. I'll also briefly discuss some of my own tools I've created, like an image converter that can convert modern image formats into palette indexed images to be read by the Commander X16, and my own custom character set which looks more like the font used on the Sega Genesis, but a deeper dive into those custom resources will have to wait for a future video. So first, there's the Commander X16 emulator, which can be downloaded from the official website. I haven't yet received my physical X16 at the time of this recording, so the emulator has been crucial for experimenting while I wait for the actual hardware to arrive. Plus, if you're interested in either developing for the X16, or playing games, or using other software people have made for it, but you can't or don't want to buy the physical product, then the emulator allows you to get the experience on any modern system. And it's free, so you can't beat the price. Next the CC65 compiler. This is a compiler for the C programming language that targets the 6502 CPU, and also has specific support for the Commander X16. For the purposes of making X16 programming more accessible, by providing higher level options than having to handcraft a program entirely from assembly code, I cannot overstate how useful it is being able to compile C code into a working X16 program. I have seen some people complain that the assembly generated by the CC65 compiler is not very efficient. I'm not well versed enough in the details to comment on that, but I can say that the impressive Vault of the Vindicator game on the X16 was coded in C using the CC65 compiler, so it is clearly possible to use it to create advanced games that run acceptably fast. The X16's relatively blazing 8 MHz clock speed probably helps in that regard. Regardless, the existence of this compiler enabling me to write my code in C has been a godsend for me. Third, there's a fairly in-depth tutorial about C programming for the X16 by M. Weidman, apologies if I butchered your name's pronunciation, which I have found very useful for learning how a lot of this stuff works. It includes good explanations of how the different memory works, some useful kernel calls you need to know, and how to interact with the VERA to achieve all the basic functionality that's required to make advanced games. And it comes with fully worked example code for all of the different topics. It has occasional minor mistakes here and there, but they're rare and pretty easy to fix, and in general I have found this tutorial to be an invaluable instructional resource. Finally, there's the Z Sound Library by Zero Byte Org. This is a pretty plug and play sound library which lets you play music and sound effects with just a handful of simple function calls. It also comes with utilities for converting modern sound formats into files usable by the Z Sound Library. This thing has been an absolute godsend to me because I've never done any sound programming in my life, and having to learn retro development on an 8 bit machine and sound programming at the same time probably would have been too daunting a task. But thanks to the existence of the Z-Sound library, all the heavy lifting of getting sound to work on the X16 has already been done. It's reasonably well documented, but I did find that the documentation was a bit scattered, so I'll see if I can provide a start-to-finish tutorial of how to install and use this library in a future video. 
As I mentioned, I've also filled in some gaps by developing some tools of my own, like a converter for modern image formats to data that can be read and understood by the X16. I'll discuss those in more detail in a future video, and, if there's interest, I might see if I can get the utilities and libraries I've been working on into shape to share for other people's use. That concludes the introduction to my devlog on game development on the Commander X16. In future videos, I'm going to do deeper dives into the different challenges that need to be solved to make games on the X16, and talk about the custom library I've been working on to serve as an abstraction layer and simplify a lot of the hardware interactions. Eventually, once we've laid all the groundwork, I'll share details about the actual games I'm developing using all these resources and my own custom library and utilities. Thank you for watching, and I hope I'll see you in the next video for some more retro game development goodness.